Okay, so what I'm gonna do real quick is go over the idea of a Boolean simplification. Now, this is gonna be taking existing Boolean logic that could be to a particular degree more complex than we actually want to work with. And we want to boil that down to something that is as optimal as we can actually get at a hardware level. So, obviously certain expressions are going to be better represented in a more complex format, but since we can deal with logical equivalency, it is going to be a better idea if the end product is a more optimal format. So, I'm just going to take a look at how we do that real quick. Alright, so again, idea of Boolean simplification. Before we can actually get to that, we need to discuss the order of operations in Boolean algebra. So, we know that we have multiplication, addition, and complement. That's what we're going to be working with here. So, multiplication, just like standard algebra, is going to take precedence over addition. Now, for complement, complement is going to be applied as soon as the entire expression under the bar is evaluated. So, if we had something like A uh, multiplied by B, complement of that, we would do everything under the bar first and then get the complement of the result. If you want to view that through the lens of propositional logic, then we would use negation, A conjoined, B. And so you're going to use a lot of parentheses in this case. So if you see me do something akin to this, it's the same thing here. Sometimes I just like doing the negation one because it's a little bit more of an easier translation from standard algebra as opposed to seeing a bunch of complement bars because you might get something that looks a bit like this sometimes and that is correct but not always the most legible so i'll probably keep the format more along with parentheses which can be used to override the precedence rules so if you ever want to make an expression very obvious at what should happen first parentheses are a very good choice but some people might disagree with that. If you do, then that's perfectly fine. I digress. So, we have two expressions here. This one and this one. First one, we have x times y plus 1 times a complement of z. And we're going to be setting the data all to 1. So all variables, x equals y equals z equals 1, is just setting all three of those to 1. So we have 1 times 1, which results in 1 plus 1 times the complement of z, which would be 1 after we substitute. Get the complement of that, we get 0. 1 times 0 is guaranteed to be 0. And then 1 plus 0 is going to be 1. We have 1 as a result. So, not too bad overall. Now, on the other side, we have x plus z uh, times, there's no like thing here, but just assume it's there. It's like standard algebra. The complement of 0 plus y. So, in this case, we start with parentheses, which is that complement, 0 plus y. We are substituting 0 for x, 1 for y, and 1 for z. So we have the complement of 0 plus 1. So the actual operation gives us 1, get the complement of that, and we have z. Uh, 0, my bad. z times 0. Now, whenever we solve that out, we end up with 0 again. We do x plus 0, which is going to be substitute 0 here. So 0 plus 0 end up with 0. Now, if we take a look at these, there are going to be a few obvious answers here. So anything times 0 is guaranteed to be 0. Anything plus 0 is guaranteed to be itself. And these come from the idea of Boolean laws, which are based on propositional laws if you deal with propositional logic. Before we can get that, the idea of Boolean equivalency has to exist before we can actually start asserting Boolean laws and the like. So, two Boolean expressions are said to be equivalent, which can be denoted by an equal sign, if they have the same value for every possible combination of values assigned to the variables contained in the expression. So, if I have expression A and expression B, and they have certain variables in them. And no matter what the combination of inputs is, 
if they yield the same results for those inputs, they are said to be identical. They are said to be equivalent, so we can interchange them as we see fit. So, we can use this concept to simplify complex Boolean expressions into more optimal formats. And that is where the idea of these Boolean laws come from. So, let's look at, I guess, the less important ones first. So, associative and commutative tend to be more in the idea of transforming an expression to be handled by a more impactful law following that. So, if we have commutative law, for example, x plus y and y plus x makes more sense for the next law. Maybe we did the distributive law or absorption law or something like that. If that made more sense, then we would apply the commutative law or apply the more complex law. Now, this one is just, again, it's a bit more of a cosmetic change because we can tell that x plus y is the same as y plus x. Doesn't really matter, but again, there is a law that dictate that that statement, that equivalency is true which goes a long way whenever we're doing verification of if one say schematic that we made for hardware is the same as another now associative is say x plus y plus z is the same as saying x plus y plus z so we can just shift the parentheses around and it doesn't actually alter the result of the expression but it might actually put it in a better format to be used later on those, I would say, are kind of the less important ones here. They have more of a transformative nature rather than actual simplification nature. Whereas if we go to, say, the idempotent law, this is the same concept saying if you have x plus x or just anything plus itself, it's just that value. So x plus x is x. It's not going to change. Same as x times x is x. So instead of having two variables in operation, you can just remove this and they are the exact same. So that one is a simplification. Distributive law, instead we have x plus y times z, we could change that to be x plus y times x plus z. But keep in mind, it's not just going from here to here, it's also going the other way as well because they're both equivalent. So if we had the format of x plus y times x plus z, we can optimize that and change it to x plus y times z. It's not only really straightforward on which one you want to do, sometimes you might have to take a step back from a more optimal format. So this one on the left side has two operations, whereas the one on the right side has one, two, three with the multiplication here. Sometimes we might need to go here in order to apply more laws. So it's not always gonna be super straightforward. For identity laws, this is the idea of x plus 0 is x, x times 1 is x. If we add nothing to something, it doesn't change the value. If we multiply anything by 1, it doesn't change the value. And conversely, very similarly, we have domination laws, which is the idea of x plus 1 is guaranteed to be 1, because anything plus 1 in Boolean algebra is 1, Whereas anything times zero is guaranteed to be zero. So the one in this case dominates the other part of this expression. So we can just remove it. And then the zero dominates this aspect. So you can just remove it. You have the zero, you have the one. No big deal. Next one here is the double complement law. It's kind of the same thing if you had, say, negative negative five in regular algebra. Uh, this is the same thing as saying negative one times negative one times five or these are just going to be one times five which is just five these basically just cancel out same thing here the two complements cancel each other out it's called the double complement law you might hear it referred to as a double involution law as well but essentially it says if you complement the complement or something it's just whatever that value was the complements don't matter they cancel each other out no big deal it happens a lot more often than you might think. Especially if you start doing optimizations, you might apply distributive law or De Morgan's law, something like that, that ends up creating 
a double complement. Now, for the regular complement laws, it's the idea of x plus the complement of x is equal to 1. So anything added to the complement of itself is guaranteed to be 1. And you'll see real quick how that works. So let's assume that x equals 0. So 0 plus the complement of 0 is 0 plus 1, which is 1. Change it to 1. 1 plus the complement of 1 is 1 plus 0, which is 1. And we change that to instead multiplication now. Now it becomes 1 times 0. 0 or 0 times 1, which is still 0. So anything added to the complement of itself is 1, whereas anything multiplied by the complement of itself is 0. And then just for every reason have the standard complement here of the complement of 0 is 1 and the complement of 1 is 0. So that's in the chart too. And then we have De Morgan's Law, which is the idea of distributing negations and transforming an operation. So this first one is x plus y, complement of it. Same thing as saying complement of x times the complement of y. Now the way that this happens, I'm going to change this to propositional logic. Uh, I'm going to change it to like propositional complement, which is negation, and do this. That's because I find this a little bit easier to both read and write. So we distribute this negation across both individual variables. Negate x, transform addition to multiplication, and then negate it y. And then we can do it conversely if we want to distribute out the negation. Then we end up with x, transform this, plus y, and again parentheses here just to make it very obvious. And that'd be De Morgan's Law. And you can do the same thing if we have uh, multiplication here first, it just transforms to addition. Now, absorption law is a bit weird. So let's take a look at this. x plus x times y is equal to x. Basically, we're just saying cut that out. Doesn't matter. So let's say we have. Hmm. I think. Zero. For x. x equals zero. So it's zero plus zero times something, which is guaranteed to be zero. So zero plus zero equals zero. Whereas if we change that to one, one plus something here, well, by the domination law, that guarantees that this one's gonna be one. So absorption law is the idea of combining two instances of identity laws. Because if we look at it, you have the identity law playing a role here, and you have the identity law playing a role here. So it ends up just being the external variable in both cases. Now, this is not something you're just going to remember, or I mean, you might remember, you might see some of these, but it's not something you're going to need to constantly remember typically whenever you deal with a lot of these types of laws and transformations you'll start to subconsciously see where optimizations can be made and obviously having these as a reference if you're going to some complex expression and you want to find out is this as optimal as i could possibly get it then having these laws on hand will be very very helpful however there are going to be some instances where some of these are just going to be very very straightforward like double complement traditional complement uh, the identity laws and domination laws and just some of these like identity laws those are pretty straightforward you'll just notice these out of habit and pattern as you do more of these stuff like noticing more complex versions of distributive laws or when and where to use the Morgan's law that is going to get into the more complex parts of simplification so here we have a fairly complex expression. So x times y plus negation of x times y 
plus z times y. There's a lot of variables here. Well, there's three variables. x, y, z. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six operations are happening in this expression. So three variables, six operations. But we can do better than that. So, first things first, let's take a look at this. Well, right off the bat, we notice this pattern right here, where this x times y and this negated x times y, both of these are being multiplied by y. So, let's just shoot that out. That gives us x plus the negation of x times y plus z times y. Well, right off the bat, that's complement law. So we can change that to just a standard one. Now we have one times y, which is going to be just y. So we can drop the one here. And that gives us y plus z times y. And we can actually technically add the one back in a way and distribute this y out again. So we have 1 times y plus z times y, which will give us 1 plus z times y. Well, this is going to have the domination law because anything added to 1 is guaranteed to be 1, leaving us with 1 times y, which again, by the identity law, it's just going to be y. So we went from three variables with six operations down to just a single variable. So if you were actually draw this out as a schematic you'd have three inputs with about six different gates going on x y z and then if we were to apply these set of operations all of a sudden all of these gates over here just go away as is the x input and z input and you're just left with the y input so all the gate logic we just have in this expression along with the x input entirely and the z input entirely, we don't need it anymore. All that logic is irrelevant. The x and the z input are relevant. We just need the y input because these are logically equivalent. So this is a very good example of why we care about simplification because there's a lot going on here. There's six total operations. Anytime that you do this expression, because you might do these things, you might make this schematic, and you might use it multiple times across a project. Every time you do it, that takes six operations, three inputs. That's expensive over the course of time as much as you scale it up. Or it's just a single input. So this is where the idea of optimization comes in in Boolean simplification. Now, what I just said there is for every Boolean expression, there is gate logic happening we can actually take a schematic and construct a Boolean expression from it. And if we have a Boolean expression, we could construct an actual circuit diagram from it. So let's take a look at this. We have inputs of x1, x2, and x3. And we have some circuit diagrams. We have not gate, and gate, two and gates actually, and an or gate. Let's actually make the Boolean expression from it. First things first, I have this NOT gate. That's going to give me the complement of x1. All right, we're going to pass that into this AND gate, which has x2 passed into it. So now I have the idea of negated x1, or the complement of x1, ANDed with x2. I'm going to put these in parentheses just to denote them. And then we have this OR gate as well, which has the result of the NOT gate, complement of X1, added to X3. These are OR together. And then finally, we have this AND gate, which is ANDing both of these together. So I'm just going to get rid of this. And say this times negation of x1 plus x3. And this is how I create the actual Boolean expression from the circuit diagram. 
And then if I wanted to, I actually the circuit diagram and I could work it backwards and make the actual boiling expression from it as well. So that's one way that we can actually get the logical reasoning, or logical rationale behind an actual circuit diagram just by looking at it. So here's an example of one. We're gonna take a look at this, make the boiling expression, then simplify the boiling expression and then draw the resulting circuit diagram. So to start with, we have three inputs. I'm gonna name them X, Y, and Z, because it's pretty easy to track those. And then we have five gates. We have three AND gates, two OR gates. Now, just at a glance, you might notice something particular about this actual schematic. And that's the fact that Y goes into all of the three first gates. It goes into this AND gate, this OR gate, this AND gate, and then it's responsible for some aspect of every part of this diagram. So let's see, what happens if I plug in a zero to Y? Well, we see a zero goes in this AND gate. That's gonna result in zero guaranteed. We see a Y go into this, so now zero's in this AND gate, zero guaranteed, which is a zero on this AND gate, zero guaranteed, which is two zeros going to the OR gates. So if Y is over zero, we don't care what X and Z is, X or Z in this case, it's going to be zero. So Y is definitely the dominant input this schematic. You're gonna see that expressed later on. But for now, let's just construct the Boolean expression. So, X is going to pass in this AND gate, Y is going to pass in this AND gate. Go ahead and make that. X, and with Y. All right, we have this OR gate, Y is going into it, so Y plus Z. Okay, so now we have this final AND gate, that is going to be the inputs Z ANDed Y. These are my initial starting points. The next step is to do this AND gate. That's the result of X plus Z times Z times Y. Which would be like this. And then the final one is just adding this X times Y plus these. So we have, mm, and write this way. Yeah, we'll write this way. X times Y plus Y plus Z times Z times Y. Now, this is the overall Boolean expression. We need to simplify this real quick. And it might not be very obvious where we want to start. So we can just rewrite this a little bit. And then it becomes a good bit more apparent how to approach this. So we can I'm gonna keep that there. Add this parenthesis. Add this parenthesis. And change this to just x, y. My plus z is fine. And z, y. Okay. So this is how I'm gonna change the writing of this. Now, with the distributive law, we can treat this multiplication, this z times y, as a single term, to a degree. So I can distribute the z times y across this y plus z. So that gives us xy plus, I'm just gonna do a little bit of shorthand, plus zy. Z. And now we can notice that we have 
two instances of the idempotent law. Because we have z times y times y, y times y is going to be y, plus z times y times z, z times z here is the idempotent law, so it's just z. So if we apply the actual two laws there, we end up with the idea of zy plus zy, which is another case of the idempotent law. So we end up with x times y plus just z times y. And if you look at that, we can apply the distributive law here and distribute out the y, giving us the final result of y times x plus z. And if we look at that zero input again, y, that would apply the domination law in this effect. So this right here, right up here, let's keep it, y times x plus z is logically equivalent to the overall schematic that we started with. Now, that's still three inputs, so we didn't drop any inputs, but we only have two operations. So if we want to write this, I would rewrite it like this. Y, X, Z, pass these inputs together to an OR gate, and then pass these inputs to an AND gate. And this schematic is identical to this schematic. They will have the same result guaranteed because we took this existing one, constructed the Boolean expression, used the idea of logical equivalency and Boolean laws to simplify the expression, and then reconstructed the new schematic based on our logical equivalent Boolean expression. So we went from having three inputs, five operations, to three inputs, two operations. So this is also a very clear example of where Boolean simplification comes into play. So that's all I have for Boolean simplification. I really do hope that that becomes very apparent why we care about optimi optimization and simplification of Boolean expressions, because when we take the idea of logic, it exists in our head and we have no expense at thinking about things. Like, again, the idea of a Boolean expression being simplified might not really make that much sense on paper or just in our head. But as soon as you start translating that to actual hardware, the actual expense for each operation, both at an actual genuine cost for the parts, but then genuine cost for complexity of the system to actually operate, because if it have more gates, that means it has to have more logic applied, it's more operations, it takes longer to compute. So it has both a cost and actual fiscal value, and then time value as well. So if we can simplify it, then we can save ourselves time, money, and it's just a genuine better system overall. Now, it's not always straightforward how to go about optimization, and sometimes it becomes more difficult to parse what's actually happening under the hood behind all the actual logic if you oversimplify things. So having the higher level, more complex expression to show what the schematic is doing can be helpful if, say, it's just more readable. Like, if you have eight operations being applied, that might be more straightforward of what's actually happening with the logic than, say, a simplified variant with, like, two expressions or three expressions, or two variables, three variables, and just a few operations. So, hopefully all that made sense. Hope you learned something. I'll see you in the next video.